It's good to see all of you. What a joy it is for me to be here with you today. I, I was excited uh, for a lot of things. Um, I saw Jonathan Diaz and his wife, uh, Hannah, who are here. He serves on the USS Ronald Reagan and is on a, a brief little leave. He's here with his six-month-old son, Jet, and there. And um, if you... I think they might be in the cry room, uh, but if you get a chance to see him, be sure to thank him for their ser- thank both of them for their service because he goes on these six month deployments and um, is away from his family for a very very long time. And uh, with all crazy things going on in the world, we want to always ask for for God to protect our troops who are out there in harm's way. And I know he's not the only one in our church who's out there. Um, hey, wasn't that a great Easter last last weekend? Um, I think that there were. Yeah, I understand there were more than 2,700 people here on campus, and um, that was just amazing, and over 400 kids in our kids' coup ministry, and I know that Pastor Greg, if he was up here, he would just want to thank all of you, all the volunteers who made that possible, because one man and even a, a small team of people can't pull off what they did last weekend, all to the glory um, of Christ, all to the glory of God, and so thank you to all of you who served um, and, and uh, you know, we, this doesn't even count the number of people who watched online. And we pray that many people came to know the Lord. Well, you know, I was given the option this morning of either kicking off a new series, I think, which, which, which they'll probably do next week, uh, or uh, share whatever God has put on my heart. And I decided to do the latter because it's been a while, um, you know, since I retired. I don't know if you know this, but... Um, it's, it's been about three quarters of a year now, and I, I don't think I've had the opportunity to just share with you um, kind of what retirement experience was like, and so I've titled today's message, Reflections of a Retired Pastor. So uh, I want to share my heart with you about a couple things. But uh, before we get started, let's open up our time in a word of par- prayer. And by the way, you know, greetings to all of you who are online. Thank you so much for being there, and for all those who are in the well uh, and in the Faith Center uh, as, as well. So let's pray together and then we'll, we'll open up God's word. Well, Father, what a, what a joy it is for me to be here today. And um, God, I, I thank you so much for this church. Uh, I love this church so much. And thank you for all that you're doing here. Thank you for Pastor Greg's leadership. Um, it allows our church to continue to grow and to thrive. And I pray, Father, for your hand of blessings to, to continue to be upon us. And, and, and insofar as blessings um, are concerned, we ask, God, that you would continue to shine your face on um, Jonathan as he serves us on the USS Ronald Reagan, this aircraft carrier, which will be deployed again soon for another six months. And we pray, God, that uh, he and Hannah would really enjoy their time with family um, as they uh, get to show off their newborn son. We pray, God, for your protection over him and for every single member uh, of the armed forces in our country, and especially those who are in our church, who are, or who are serving out there, in many cases, in, in a very difficult situation. Bless their families as well. And Lord, will you bless us? I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, that you would have your way with us, that you would teach us, that we would walk away from this place different than when we came in. So we love you, Lord, and we ask uh, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you may not know me because you've just come to our church recently, but I used to be the p- senior pastor here until I retired at the end of June of last year after serving for nearly 31 years. And as I said, it's been three quarters of a year since I retired, and uh, time sure does fly. You know, the one thing that came to mind as I thought about the last nine months, what it's been like, and even the time leading into it, and I would say that it was, that has been characterized by uh, a degree or a high degree of grieving and mourning. Um, we lost some dear people since I retired, like Roy Motonaga, who is Naomi's husband and Robin's father. He was a wonderful man, like Bob Nakamura. And then shortly after we lost Bob, we lost his wife, Michi. Uh, that came so suddenly and unexpectedly. And Michi was a part of our church for more than two decades and so I knew her quite well, and for quite a number of years, she would come into our church every Monday and Tuesday to answer phones for us. And she was a very giving person, a very generous person. One day, she was out shopping here locally, and she came across a stack of 
of Japanese newspapers with Shohei Otani's picture on the cover. And because they were free, she grabbed a couple. It was this beauty right here. She grabbed a couple and brought it to me, knowing that I was a fan. And uh, I was so excited when she handed these to me because I knew that these items can fetch a lot of money because people will buy anything with Shohei's picture on it. And so I asked if they might have any more. And she said, well, let me go back and check. And so she went back to the store and checked. And sure enough, there were some more. So she grabbed more copies for me and brought it back. And I was ecstatic because I knew that I could fetch a, fetch a good amount of money on eBay <laughs> for them. And so if you're interested <laughs> in <laughs> buying one of these newspapers from me, see me after the service. Uh, I'm selling them for $100 a, a pop. So... Uh, <laughs> But seriously, even though Bob and Michi and Roy are with the Lord, it, it still grieves us that they're not here. And, you know, another occasion when I grieved, and I continue to grieve, was, uh, was when Shohei signed with the Dodgers. That just... <laughs> and I want to thank all of you who blew up my phone on the day that they announced that he was signing with the Dodgers. Well, recently, my daughter, Natalie, who's here somewhere serving, um, bought me a Dodger t-shirt. Now, bless her heart. And she knew that I was in mourning. So rather than give me a, a Dodger shirt in Dodger blue, she got me one in black, and I just had to show it to you. It's in black because I'm in mourning, and there it is. And I'm going to cover it back up. So, <laughs> all kidding aside, the pathway leading to my retirement was, in fact, marked with grief. And I want to share an article with you that I came across recently that really expressed exactly how I felt. It was written by Pastor Lon Solomon upon his retirement from his church, McLean Bible Church in Virginia in 2017. And uh, he was succeeded by a young man named David Platt, whom many of you are familiar with, just a, a wonderful pastor. But in that article, it, it, which resonated with me deeply, Solomon wrote, he started by writing that, first of all, there are three seasons in the life of a senior pastor. The first season, he said, is when that pastor is first called to the church and so he and the congregation do this dance where they're just kind of getting to know each other. And he said that first season is, is probably will last anywhere from five to ten years. And he said many senior pastors don't even make it through that first season because so often they'll leave or they'll quit before they get through that first season. Again, anywhere from five to ten years. And the second season, he said, is when the senior pastors in the church begin to 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 uh, become friends. They become friends and they begin to trust him and they begin to, you know, they begin to find out that he really cares about them. And this season, he said, also lasts for about five to ten years. And so if you put the two together, that would bring a, a senior, senior pastor's tenure to about 15 to 20 years. And that brings us to the third season. And Solomon said that that third season is characterized by the senior pastor and the congregation falling in love with one another. He said they just love each other. And he said that happens after the senior pastor has been leading the flock for, for at least 20 years or more. And then here's how he described that third season. And I'll put it up here for you. He said, quote, in this stage, the pastor begins to really understand the words of the Apostle Paul when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, there is on me every day the load of my concern for the churches because he begins to carry a deep burden for the church and its people. It's a burden, Solomon said, that no one can understand except the long-serving long senior pastor because it is a spiritual burden that the Holy Spirit lays only on him. His staff, the elders, and prayerful people in the church family can help him carry the burden, but none of them will ever fully experience and understand it. It is uniquely the pastor's. And even though the Spirit will give him grace to carry it, the burden is still unrelenting and often quite heavy. And this final season is beautiful. A church in love with their pastor, and he in love with them. And this is the part of what makes it so hard for a long-serving senior pastor to step away. It's not just retirement. 
It's almost like death. And the grief on both sides is real and tangible. You know, when I read this, I couldn't help but choke up because it articulated better than I could exactly why I was mourning over my retirement. And it was because of you. It's all your fault. <laughs> and I don't want to be presumptuous to think that the feeling was mutual because there are probably some of you out there thinking, yes, the old guy's finally retiring. But on my end, you were the reason why it was so painful to step away because you'd become so dear to me. Not that you weren't before, but as Solon said, in the third season, you really begin to understand what it means to carry the burden of the church or for the church. You know, the Apostle Paul expressed a very similar sentiment in a letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi. And I want to show this, for you, show this to you, and it'll be, kind of the, it'll be kind of the launching pad for the message today. But Philippians 1.7, I'll put it up here for you. Paul wrote, it is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. What a tender description or depiction of love that Paul had for the church. He held them in his heart. And I so identify with this, and I know that even Pastor Greg so identifies with this. We hold you in our hearts. So why did Paul hold them in his heart? Well, let me spend, take a little time, um, spend a little time kind of answering that question. According to According to the theory of evolution, according to the theory of evolution, man came about as a result of an accident. Evolutionists believe that we are an accident. Check out this article which appeared in New Scientist, which claims to be the world's most popular weekly science and technology publication. And you can see it on the very top left-hand corner. It says, lucky you, accidents of evolution that made us human. And the article goes on to say, and I'll just read a, a few paragraphs for you. Earth, several million years ago, a cosmic ray blasts in the atmosphere at close to speed of light. It collides with an oxygen atom, generating a shower of energetic particles, one of which knocks into a DNA molecule within a living creature. That DNA molecule happens to reside in a developing egg cell within an ape-like animal living in Africa. The DNA is altered by the collision, mutated, and the resulting offspring is slightly different from its mother. The mutation gives the offspring an advantage over its peers in the competition for food and mates. And so, as the generations pass, it is carried by more and more of the population. Eventually, it is present in nearly everyone, and so the altered version of the DNA should really no longer be called a mutation. It's just one of the regular 23,000 or so genes that make up the human genome. While cosmic rays are thought to be one source of mutations, DNA copying errors during egg and sperm production may be a more common cause, whatever their origins. These evolutionary accidents took us on a six million year journey from something similar to a great ape to us, homo sapiens. You know, as new scientists didn't take themselves seriously, you would almost think that this narrative was lifted from a Michael Bay science fiction movie. It's so wild. But evolutionists believe that we are an accident. And we are a minor accident. Thomas Marcus Bonnet, who is a researcher at the Institute of Evolutionary Biology, said, quote, we are just a minor accident in the great evolutionary scale of the Earth. You are just a minor accident. And then several years ago, Newsweek published an article titled Human Existence in an Accident Based on a Totally Random Genetic Mutation. And Newsweek went on to say that 700 million years ago, I wonder how they came up with that. I wonder how they knew that. 700 million years ago, there was a random error in our genetic code, and that mistake set the stage for our bodies to develop vital organs, which we have today. See, the upshot... The upshot of evolutionary world, the evolutionary worldview, which, by the way, is taught in every public school in America, is that humans don't have any intrinsic value or worth because we're just an accident. 
you're just an accident. And we're animals like every other animal in the animal kingdom. And that means unborn babies don't have worth. Children and adults with disabilities don't have any worth. People in third world countries don't matter. Neither do poor people. Neither do immigrants. Neither do people without an education or transgender people. And old people, they certainly don't have any value whatsoever. And this totally flies in the face of a biblical worldview and how God sees people. See, I believe the reason, the first reason why Paul helped people in his heart was because he understood. He understood that people were valuable because they were made and created in the image of Almighty God. You were created in the image of God. In fact, in the very first book of the Bible, the very first one, Genesis 1, first chapter, verse 26, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now stop right there. Notice the plural, let us make man in our image. Why, why, doesn't it say, why doesn't it say, let me make man in my image, but it says, let us make man in our image. That's because Jesus was there with God, with his father as the co-creator of the universe. And he says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You are created in the image of God. And you know what that means? Let me, what does it mean that you're created in the image of God? Well, it's kind of like these photos right here. Here's Pastor Greg and Evan. Right? Here's Tommy Watson on the right and his son Corey. And here's Pastor Dave and his wife and his son Carter, right? Not his wife. <laughs> Evan and Corey are spitting images of their dad. And in fact, if Corey had glasses and a beard, he'd look just like Tommy. <laughs> right? Or if or if Tommy didn't have a beard and glasses, he'd look just like Corey. And I'm not sure about Pastor Dave and Carter. Carter's way cuter than Pastor Dave, right? <laughs> oh, what a cuter, cutie guy. But the Hebrew word for image, the Hebrew word for image in verses 26 and 27 means resemblance or it means likeness. In other words, you are made in the likeness of God. You, 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 are, you bear a striking resemblance to our Father in heaven, which means you're not an accident, you're not random. You didn't happen by chance. You didn't descend from monkeys. You were created in the image of God. And Paul added this in Ephesians 2 verse 10. He said, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And I like the NLT version of this. Paul said, for we are God's masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. Every single one of you is a masterpiece. No one has your DNA. There is no one like you. And I like what David wrote about how special we are. And for all of you who feel so insecure about yourselves, listen to this. Psalm 139, starting in verse 13. David wrote, and I like it in the NLT. He wrote, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. I love this part. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. Your thoughts about me cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake you are still with me. Amazing. You are of infinite worth because God knit you together, just stitched you together in your mother's womb. And every day of your life, it was recorded in his book. And by the way, this passage, I believe this passage is one of the strongest, the strongest arguments for why abortion is wrong. Because according to this passage, you are a life in God's eyes. Even before, you, even before you come into the world, you are already alive. And God's thoughts toward you are uncountable. 
They outnumber the grains of sand on the earth. Wrap your heads around that one. You know, I had the opportunity to witness the preciousness of life nearly every day in the 30 years that I served here. As parents would show me photos of an ultrasound revealing that they had a 10-week-old baby inside of them. Or as I gazed into the eyes of their newborn six, 30, 30 weeks later. I did that this morning. I had the opportunity as, as Jonathan was holding Jet to look into his beautiful eyes. I saw this, the preciousness of life, when I played with Ecuadorian kids in Quito on a dusty playground. Or when I tried to convince someone struggling with depression not to take their own life because they are precious to God. As I begged a husband and wife to reconcile and to forgive one another as they were in the heat of marital strife because their life mattered. As I grasped the hand of a 95-year-old preparing to pass into eternity, every life is precious. No wonder, hell, no wonder Paul held people in, in, in his heart because he recognized that they mattered to God, therefore they mattered to him. Second reason why I believe Paul held the church in his heart was because of what the church signified, what it represented, what the church is. And, and you know this from reading the scriptures. And I'll, let me just give you a quick little review. The church is the people of God. We'll put these up here for you. The church is the people of God. We know that from 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. We know that the church is the household of God. The, ho- the word household in Greek means family. We see that in 1 Timothy 3.15. We know the church is the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18. We know that the church is the bride of Christ. Revelation uh, 22.17. And we know that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15. And we've covered all these things in the past. But there's one more thing that the church is that I'm not sure we've spent a lot of time talking about. But I want to do that today. But before I get to it, I want to enlighten you on God's dream. And I want you to stay with me on this because this is, this is so good. Right? What is God's dream? I want to enlighten you on God's dream, God's hope, God's desire. And it's this. God, and it can be summed this way, God loves people. Therefore, he longs to be with them. That's his dream. It's always been God's dream. I love people, and I just want to be with them. I just want to hang out with him. I just want to do life with him and have them do life with me. It began the very very beginning, the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3.8, I'm not going to put it up here for you, but Genesis 3.8 says he walked, God walked in the cool of the garden simply because he wanted to be with them. I mean, they were his prized possession of all the things that he'd ever created. Adam and Eve were his prized possessions, and he just wanted to be with them. And then they disobeyed him. And Sin and brokenness entered the world. But that didn't diminish God's dream to dwell with his people. So he worked his plan, and he worked his plan. Years later, after the Jews were freed from captivity in Egypt, and they ended up in the Sinai Desert, God instructed the Jews to make a tabernacle so he could be with them. So he could fulfill that dream so that he could dwell with him. Exodus 25, verse 8 says, And so let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. There it is. He wanted to dwell with them. That was his dream, to dwell with his people, the Jews. The tabernacle, by the way, was a tent. It was temporary. It could be moved every time the Jews picked up stakes to wander around the desert. And every time they picked up stakes, God went with them because he was in that tent. Here's a replica of of what the tabernacle looked like. might give you an idea. And it enabled, the tabernacle enabled God to dwell with his people. And then after the Jews reached the promised land, there was no need for a portable tabernacle. And so it was replaced by the temple, which was a permanent structure that was built by King Solomon. 2 Chronicles 6 verse 1 says, Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness, but I have built you an exalted house, the temple a place for you to dwell in forever. There it is again. He just wanted to dwell with his people. So he created this temple. They built this temple. Here's what it might have looked like right here. This is a model that that, uh, I saw in uh, Jerusalem. And the temple enabled God to dwell among his people. And it stood for roughly 371 years right there in the heart of Jerusalem. 
And then it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And after it was torn down, after it was ripped down by the Babylonians, the dwelling place of God, think about this, the dwelling place of God disappeared from the face of the earth. And God's dream to dwell with his people was dashed. Well, fortunately, the temple was reconstructed. It was rebuilt. The, the, it was, uh, that rebuilding was completed in 515 B.C. According to the prophet Haggai, God's glory in that second temple was greater than the glory that was in the first temple. And that second temple stood for roughly 585 years. Continued to be there for 585 years. God dwelled in that temple. And then it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. Remember, Christ died around 33 A.D. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. And once again, after the temple was demolished, the dwelling place of God disappeared from planet Earth. But here's the thing. Those setbacks didn't deter God from his dream and his desire to dwell with his people. His heart remained steadfast. He wanted to dwell with his people, so he worked his plan. And he saw the destruction of the temple coming because God is all-knowing. And this time, instead of erecting another tent, this time, instead of erecting another temple, a third temple, God chose to dwell among his people, get this, through a human being. Crazy. He decided to dwell among his people through a human being. You can't make this up. You can't make this up. It was a stroke of genius. God came to dwell among us his one and, through his one and only son. The Apostle Paul John described, Apostle, Paul, um, well, Apostle John described the phenomenon this way in John 1, verse 1. He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then you jump down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There it is again. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. God in human flesh came to dwell among men. And his name was Jesus. And then tragedy struck. Jesus died. When he was around the age of 33, he was crucified on a cross for our sins. They killed God's son. And it seemed as if all was lost and God would never dwell on the earth again. But God was so passionate about being with his people. That was his dream to just dwell among his people that he continued working his plan. And shortly before Christ died, he clued us in on what that plan was. Take a look at John 14, verse 16. And it says, and I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells in you, dwells with you and will be with you. There it is again. He came, he sent, his, he sent the Holy Spirit. He was gonna give us the Holy Spirit that word helper there was a reference to the Holy Spirit, and he was going to give us the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who is equal to God, who is equal to Jesus. He was going to give us, once Jesus was gone, he was going to give us the Holy Spirit to come, not only be with us, to be, but, but to be in us. That's what verse 17 says, and that's exactly what happened. After Jesus died and was raised from the dead, he stayed on earth for another 40 days, Appearing, appearing to his followers. And then on the 40th day, he ascended into heaven. Ten days later, so that we wouldn't be without God's dwelling on the earth. Ten days later, that would have been 50 days after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven to planet earth to dwell in believers, to live in the hearts of all those who believed in Christ. And even today, even today, every time someone declares that they believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of that person. And it is uncanny, it is miraculous, and it is for real. Would you like to have God live inside of you? I mean, you can do that today. You can ask him to live inside of you today because that's what he does. And here's what Paul said about this in a letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth. Notice this, and, and I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. I love this because Paul quotes God. He quotes God. 
Paul wrote, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, first of all, the reason why the last sentence is all capped is because in the New American Standard Bible translation, they always, the editors always capitalize quotations that come to the Old Testament. And this is a quotation that comes from the Old Testament. But here it is in God's own words. He said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will dwell in them. That was the promise of the Holy Spirit coming to planet Earth. Paul said something similar in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He said, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. I mean, Paul said, you are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. Not a temple made with hands that can be destroyed, like Solomon's temple, but a human temple. You are a human temple in which God's spirit dwells. One more thing. When the Holy Spirit came down from heaven to take up residence in human hearts, the church was born. That's how the church was born. And, and thus, the church is not only the people of God. Remember that list I showed you at the beginning? Let me put it up here for you again. The church is not only the people of God and the household of God and the body of Christ and the bride of Christ and the pillar and foundation of the truth. It is this. It is the dwelling place of God. The church is the dwelling place of God. And I'm not talking about this building, but I'm talking about you. You are the dwelling place of God. This is where God dwells and lives on planet Earth, through you, through us. Think about that. You are the dwelling place of the Almighty, and He wants to live through you. He wants to live through us. And get this, one day when the church is raptured and the way things are going, that might happen at any moment, but when the rapture, the rapture occurs, everyone in whom God's Spirit dwells will be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. It will happen in an instant, in a flash, and when we're gone, once that rapture occurs, when we're gone, think about this, so will God's presence. God's presence will no longer be on this earth because God's presence dwells through his people, is manifested through his people. But once we're taken up, God's presence will, not, will no longer dwell on this earth. And that's why all hell will break loose right after the rapture. All hell is going to break loose because there will be no restraining influence, which is the, the Holy Spirit. No restraining influence to, to tap to tamp down the evil that is taking place today. And, and this period of history, this period in man's history will be called the Great Tribulation. And if you think things are bad now, just wait till that happens. But don't lose heart. If you, if you have Christ in you, you have nothing to worry about because you will be one. You will be one. If it occurs in our lifetime, you will be one who will be raptured. And not only that, at the end of the Great Tribulation, according to the Bible, and by, by the way, Pastor Greg and I did a series on Revelation where we talk about all this. I think it was back in 2016. Go back and look at it. Um, look, check it out um, on our, on our uh, YouTube channel. But um, at the end of the Great Tribulation, Jesus will come. He will come, return to earth. And then one day, one day the new Jerusalem, which is the name of heaven, will come down from heaven to earth and here's how the Apostle John described that scene. Revelation 21, verse 2, John wrote, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. There it is again. The dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. God's dream will finally come to fruition. Full circle. He will dwell with us and we will dwell with him for forever and ever and ever. No more interruptions. No more temples being destroyed. It will last forever. And it's no wonder that Paul held the church in his heart because you are the dwelling place of God. The church is the dwelling place of God. I mean, let me ask you something. Do you hold 
the church in your heart? Meaning, do you hold the people around you in your heart? Do you hold the people to your left and to your right and the person sitting behind you and the person sitting in front of you, do you hold them in your heart? Well, it, it's not just something pastors ought to do. I believe we all ought to hold people in our heart, young people, children, seniors, couples, single people, men, women. We should hold everyone in our hearts because the Spirit of God lives in the church. Let me close with one final thought. You know, since, since I retired, a lot of people have said to me, look at what you did, look at what you did. You know, you built this great church. And I really appreciate that, I, I do. But, but to be honest, I didn't build this church. I didn't build this church. Jesus did. Jesus built the church. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said this to Peter. He said, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me point out a couple things here. First, Jesus said that he was going to build his church. He said, I will build my church. I will build my church. Not man, but Jesus. I mean, he certainly uses people, right? Just as he, he used hundreds of you last week just to put on an Easter service. But he uses people, but it's Jesus who builds the church. At the end of the day, people don't build the church. Jesus does. All the credit goes to him. Second, he referred to the church as his church. I will build my church, he said. This, I will build my church. Now, you see, the church doesn't belong to people. It doesn't belong to one person. South Bay Community Church is, was not Pastor Gary's church, and now it's Pastor Greg's church. No, this is Jesus' church. Right? It's his church. Third, the church that he promised to build was not a building. He said, I'm going to build this building so you can have a place to go to. No, no, no. When he said, I'm, I'm going to build this church, what he's talking about was, I'm going to build people. I'm going to build up people. And if you put all these things together, if you put what he said together with what we just talked about, how people are precious, made in the image of God, and how, how God dwells in and through people, if you combine all these things together, um, then you can't help but come to this one conclusion, and it's this. There isn't anything more important on this earth than the church. There isn't anything more valuable on planet earth than the church. There isn't anything that... Jesus treasures more than the church because he purchased the church with his own blood. You are bought with a price, remember that? The church belongs to him. He is the head of the church. You are precious in his sight and the spirit of God lives inside of you. There isn't anything more valuable on this earth than the church. Church consultant, Kerry Newhoff, I, lo I love this. He said, the church is not a place you go to. He said, the church is something you are. I love that. The church is something you are. It is not a place. It's what you are. It's who we are. And that's why I love the church. I know that's Pastor Greg's heart. Boy, he just loves the church. It's why, it's why Paul held the church in his heart. You know, people who say, I'm done with church. It's full of hypocrites. I don't need the church. I can watch it from home. You got it all wrong, right? You got it all wrong. You, you can't watch who you are on the phone. See, you can't be done with the church until Jesus is done with the church and he takes us home to be with him. See, there's no, there's no church in heaven, right? There's just Jesus and us, right? You, you can't say you don't need the church because when you say you don't need the church, what you're really saying is you don't need people. And we all need people. Well, I need people. I desperately need people. And the sad part is, according to the, all the polls that are being taken these days, more and more people are leaving the church. In fact, I, record numbers. There are, people are leaving the church. You know, the last thing that Jesus said about the church in Matthew 16, 18 after he said, I will build a church, he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, which implies that the church will come under attack. 
I mean, and, and, that, and that shouldn't be any surprise, right? Shouldn't be any surprise. If Jesus said, I'm going to build a church, what's Satan going to do? He's going to do everything he can to make, make sure that, that doesn't happen. And if you build a church, he's going to do everything he can to tear it down, right? So this implies that the church will come under attack just like Adam and Eve came under attack in the Garden of Eden from the serpent who was the devil. Just like the temple of God, where God dwelt, came under attack by the Babylonians and then by the Romans. Just like Jesus came under attack from the religious Jews and they crucified him. In the same way, Satan will attack the church through persecution, which is ramping up all over the world today by sowing division, by sowing complacency, by getting it to stray from the truth of God's word, which we're seeing in droves. He will attack the church by attacking its leaders. The devil will do whatever it takes to destroy the church, but he's not going to win. Jesus made this that promise, which means if Satan will do whatever he can to destroy the church, you know what it means? It means he's going to do whatever he can to destroy you. He will just do whatever he can to destroy the work of God in you. Therefore, whatever you do, church, stay close to Jesus. All right, stay close to Jesus. Stay in his word. Read the Bible. Worship him passionately. We've have, we have got great, a great worship team here to lead us. Worship the Lord passionately. Serve him faithfully so that, the world, that, so that the Christ that is in you will be known by everybody else. Pray fervently. Love each other deeply. Hold the family of God in your heart. You know, with whatever time I have left on this earth, I don't know how much time that is, but whatever time I have left on this earth, I want to dedicate myself to, to helping the church thrive. Will you join me in that? Will you join me in that? I hope you will. Because there's nothing on earth more valuable than the church. Now let's close in prayer. As you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, even those of you watching in the Faith Center in the well, I want to ask you a question. Maybe you're here today, you've been coming for a few weeks, or maybe this is the first time, and this is all kind of new to you. I'm gonna, I've, I've got a question for you. Would you like for God to dwell in your heart? Would you like for Him to come and live inside of you and through you I hope you'd say yes to that and if you would like him to live inside of you God will never barge his way into your life he'll only come if you invite him to so invite him to right now just say this to him Jesus I believe that you are God's son that you came to planet earth to dwell with man and you ended up dying on a cross for my sins, but you were raised from the dead. I believe in you. And right now, I want to ask you to come into my life. Come and dwell inside of me, Holy Spirit, and live in me and through me. Will you just tell him that? And if you just told him that, what I described is exactly what happened. The Holy Spirit just at that very moment entered your life. Amazing. It's real. It's uncanny. Be sure to tell somebody before you leave here today that you made that decision. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for what the church is. Thank you and we are so precious to you. Every single person, no matter what they're struggling with, no matter how insecure they may feel, no matter what disabilities they struggle with, no matter what kind of illnesses they're battling, we are all so precious in your sight. And thank you for sending Jesus to die and then for giving us your Holy Spirit that you might live in us. Father, so many of us, we haven't treated these temples very well, these temples that you live in. 
Help us to glorify you in our bodies, the temples in which you live. And Lord, I pray that you would, you would work in us in such a way that we would allow you to work in us and through us so that everyone around us will know that you are God, that you are on this earth. So thank you, Father, so much. And thank you for South Bay Community Church. What a special place this is. Father, I pray you're, that you would continue to cause this church to grow and to thrive and bring glory and honor to you. Thank you, Father, for all these things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.